hacks to crush one, two, no limit live cash games. These hacks will also work for pretty much any small or medium stakes live cash game. And they're going to go a long way to helping you win a whole lot more money from these games. I realize that small stakes cash games give some players fits. I realize the rake is often high and the players are really bad. And while the high rake is not a good thing, the fact that your opponents are bad is a very good thing. Realize that if you want to crush these games, you need to have good fundamentals. You really do. You need to learn how to play good, strong, fundamentally sound poker. And very importantly, you need to learn to exploit the common mistakes that all of your opponents will inevitably make. If we are live right now. Let me know. Type something in the comment section. Type something in the box. The chat boxes. I know that we are here. Otherwise, I'm just speaking to myself, and that's no good. In this webinar today, you're going to learn a bunch of stuff. But very importantly, you're going to learn how to go about three betting logically before the flop. Also, we're going to be discussing the number one mistake that I see small stakes cash game players make. And we're going to be going through my top tip for exploiting the recreational players that you will inevitably encounter in these games. All right, so tip number one is to three bet more often pre-flop. So many players just want to splash around before the flop and try to make good hands post-flop. But that is not how you actually crush one to no limit. Instead, you crush these games by using aggressive strategies and isolating the weak players with three bets. It is good to play heads up against one bad player, because then you're going to be able to really maximize your skill edge. If you call and see the flop seven ways, yeah, there's still some skill involved, but you kind of have to make a hand. And certainly you can play a little bit tighter than your opponents that will result in you making slightly better hands than your opponents. And you will potentially be able to win some money. But if you really want to crush the games, you want to make the pots bigger against one player who has a relatively marginal range. Let's just discuss a few common scenarios. These are charts right from the PokerCoaching.com app. We now have multi-way charts for cash games in our app, both for games with a rake and games without a rake. So you can go through there and put, like, say, under the gun raises and the cutoff calls. What do you do on the button? Well, now we know. So let's take a look at these two common scenarios and discuss how you need to be playing. First, let's discuss this chart where we're 100 big blinds deep on the button versus a low jack raise to three big blinds. These charts here are going to presume, I think these are our no rake charts, and you will see here that you want to be three betting with aces, kings, queens, and ace king for value. Maybe a little bit of jacks and tens. And that's it. Those are the only hands you are three betting for value. Everything else is essentially a bluff. And you're going to find that as you get deeper and deeper stacked, you're primarily going to want to be three betting with hands like suited aces, suited kings, and the low suited connected hands. These are the best hands to be three betting. We also have us three betting here with king, queen offsuit, ace, queen offsuit, and ace jack offsuit a little bit. Now, you may be surprised at how incredibly tight this chart looks. But if your opponent is playing a reasonable range, you do have to be tight yourself. Now, I will say that in most live cash games, most players raise too wide to begin with. If your opponents are raising too wide to begin with, you are going to want to adjust by three betting wider for value, maybe all jacks or tens and better, ace, king, ace, queen suited, stuff like that. But then you still are going to have a decently wide three betting range, primarily with hands containing ace x suited or king x suited or low suited connectors. You can also call a little bit wider. I mean, I realize this chart's folding out ace jack off suit, king jack off suit, ace 10 off suit, king eight suited, queen nine suited, jack nine suited, nine eight, eight seven, seven six suited. These are all hands that are certainly reasonable to call, and I probably would, which is why, I mean, I want to make it very clear. You need to understand what the GTO strategy is, but then the logical adjustment to take advantage of the mistakes that your opponents are making, right? If you just blindly pull up game theory optimal charts that presume your opponents play perfectly, and then your opponents play far from perfectly, well, then you're leaving money on the table, right? If your opponents do something wrong, you need to exploit it. So you're still going to be three betting with a similar selection of hands on the bottom portion of the range, but... Just, um, you know, perhaps slightly more often in general, because you don't really care if your opponent's going to raise with king eight offsuit and call your three bet if you're sitting here with the king 10 suited or the ace x suited, right? They're just going to miss the flop a lot and then give you the pot. The button is the one spot where you do get to have a decently wide calling range from all other seats, though. You're going to want to be 
three betting most of the hands that you are going to play. And that's especially true from the small blind. Here we have the small blind strategy versus a button raise, 100 big blinds deep. And we see in this scenario, we are three betting almost every hand that we are going to play. And our only calling hands are some suited aces, king nine suited, queen nine suited, and some small and medium pairs. All right, what stakes online does this equate to? Realize at the end of the day, the stakes don't actually matter all that much. What matters is what do your opponents do incorrectly in your specific game? Now, you can make broad assumptions about things like one, two, no limit, or five cent, 10 cent online, right? And certainly you will realize that some players are making the same errors, but quite often the errors that people are making in live poker are usually a little bit different than online poker. And online poker, people typically, you know, they're more tight aggressive in general, right? And if they're more tight aggressive in general, the exploits are going to be different than if they are loose and passive, right? Here we have a three big blind raise. It's usually small for live opponents. Well, it depends on the game, right? Again, in some live games, people make it seven big blinds preflop, and they literally cannot win. If your opponents make it seven big blinds preflop, or hey, if you make it seven big blinds preflop, you are going to have a nearly impossible time winning at live poker. I hate to break it to you. The way you win is by playing good, strong, fundamentally sound ranges and then adjusting to what your opponent's doing correctly. And you're going to find that pretty much everyone plays tighter when you make it seven big blinds preflop. Now, maybe your opponents won't and they're just horrifically bad. But fortunately for you, you will crush that game so hard where your opponents are calling seven big blind raises with the queen four offsuit that you'll get rich quickly and you'll be able to move up in stakes and then life will be easier because then you can just play closer to GTO. But look. If your opponents are making blunders left and right, the game becomes trivially easy. For example, say your opponents literally never bluff on the river. When they bet on the river, they have top pair, top kicker, or better every time because they are just that bad. Well, what do you do on the river when they bet? Don't pay them off. It's not hard, right? If your opponents raise the seven big lines preflop with a bunch of garbage, what is the exploit? Free bet them a lot especially in position with a good, strong, linear range. And they're going to be in horrible shape from out of position. Get in there and crush them. Life's easy, right? Fortunately, poker is uh, kind of like chess in that you need to think a few moves ahead. But unlike chess, you don't have to think 45 moves ahead. You have to think literally two or three. We can do it. We can think two or three moves ahead. And we'll be fine and good. Seven big blinds go six-handed easy. Exactly, Matt Mo which is why you want to be three betting with a good, strong linear range. Literally exactly what I said. If your opponents are going to be raising huge before the flop, three bet with a good, strong linear range, they'll call with all sorts of nonsense, and then you will crush them. It's not not rocket science here, everyone. All right, back on track. From the small blind against the button, you're not going to want to have much of a calling range. You're going to want to three bet the majority of hands you want to play because from the small blind, when someone raises and you call in the small blind, the big blind is going to get to call with all sorts of stuff. And you don't want to be playing a three-way pot out of position where you're going to check the flop, the big blind is going to check the flop, the initial raiser is going to bet, and then you have to say and act before, say what you're going to do and act before the big blind, right? And that is not good for you at all. Is this live? It is indeed live, although there will be a recording on YouTube. Okay? So... You want to be three betting most of the hands you play from the small blind. Consider though, consider what happens in most live cash games. In most live cash games, the button raises and the small blind calls with all sorts of trash. And that is excellent for you because your opponents are blundering left and right. And if they're making these blunders left and right and you don't, you are going to completely crush your opponents. We're going to update the InstaPoker app. I am not in charge of that app at all. I made some content for that app about 10 years ago. Is this the Matrix? Maybe. Fortunately for you, I mean, look, (laughs) funny enough, is this the Matrix? I can't believe that people play as poorly as you all tell me they play in small stakes live cash games. And um, a lot of people can't figure out how to win. It is not hard to beat players who make blunders left and right. Okay? Okay. Learn to play good, strong, fundamentally sound poker. Logically adjust to what they do wrong, and then you will smash them. And the thing is, a lot of people say, oh, if they make it seven big blinds pre-flop, and I three-bet with ace-jack offsuit, and they call, they out-flop me a lot. Yeah. You got to play poker still. Get used to it. What size do you three-bet to? Typically, you're going to three-bet to about the size of the pot when you are in position, and a little bit more than the size of the pot from out of position. 
So we see here, makes like a three big blind raise. We're three betting to 12 big blinds out of position and 10 big blinds in position. If your opponent make it seven big blinds pre-flop, make it 20, right? How do you know if you're getting junk hands, which are not on any of the charts? If the, if when, Well, the hands are on the charts. They say to fold. Fold your garbage. Don't play bad hands. All right. Here we go. Number two, fight harder when you are in position. Most players play way too tightly against three bets. And to be fair, that is a great adjustment when you are out of position against straightforward players who just have good, strong hands. If you do think your opponent's don't three bet enough. You should be raising slightly wider than the GTO ranges because you're going to get to see the flop and realize your equity very, very well. But when they three bet you, especially when you're out of position, you're going to be against a very strong range and you should fold a lot. But when you are guaranteed to be in position, you want to be fighting hard and using your positional advantage. And this becomes even more and more and more true as stacks get deeper and deeper and deeper. Okay? In position... When you raise and someone three bets from the blinds, you need to be calling a lot. I'll give you an example. Here is your strategy. 200 big blinds deep when you raise the button to three big blinds and then the small blind three bets to 12 big blinds. You're supposed to fold all the offsuit stuff. Offsuit hands are bad when you're deep stacked. And you're supposed to call the vast majority of suited stuff that's not terrible. All right? Notice we're only really folding king five suited, queen seven suited, jack seven suited, eight five suited. 69 suited is not, not quite good enough when you're 200 big blinds deep. And as you see, we are calling a ton. Notice we're not actually four betting all that much. We're four betting, literally, aces, kings, ace, king suited, a few blocker bluffs with ace x, ace, king, ace, queen, ace, check off suit, some ace x suited, some king x suited, and some low suited connectors. But that's it. We are calling a ton because we are in position closing the action. And that's a very, very, very good spot to be in. Only 24 likes so far. Click the like and subscribe button. You all like the 69 suited in the chat? All right, congratulations. Enjoy. If you enjoy that, click the like and subscribe button down below. And if you don't, enjoy it as well. You got to call the three bets in position. You are going to flop something. Your opponent's going to bet. You're going to stick around and you're going to be able to drastically over-realize your equity. When you are in position, deep stacked, you will substantially over-realize your equity. So you need to stick around very frequently. Oh, very notably, by the way, notice offsuit hands are bad. I got to say it over and over again. King Jack offsuit folds to a three bet, as does ace 10 offsuit. These hands are not good enough to call a three bet. However, king seven suited is, jack eight suited is, seven five suited, five three suited, any pair. Okay? Suited hands are really good when you're playing deep stack because when you make flushes, you're very, very happy. Doesn't this depend on the opponent's strategy? Of course it does, Chris. Everything I'm saying here depends on the opponent's strategy. Maybe you weren't here in the beginning. If you want to crush one, two live cash games, you need to have good fundamentals and learn to exploit common mistakes. If your opponent three bets literally aces and kings only, you should fold almost everything except for pairs and suited connected hands that flop very, very well. When your opponents make blunders, maximally exploit them. This chart here presumes your opponent plays good, strong, fundamentally sound poker. They're going to be three betting, not exactly this, but something kind of like this. This is what good, strong, fundamentally sound poker looks like from the small blind. This is a 100 big blind chart. 200 big blind chart doesn't look so different. And so this is what you do 200 big blinds deep. All right. Obviously, you have to be folding stuff like ace, jack, offsuit, and king, queen, offsuit if your opponent three bets only with aces and kings. But if they three bet only with aces and kings, they literally cannot win. Unless, of course, you're terrible. All right, number three. You need to learn to play well with marginal made hands. The number one mistake I've seen for years and years and years for players in small stakes cash games is that they constantly overvalue marginal made hands. They think, I probably have the best hand, so I'm going to bet. Or I probably have the best hand, so I'm going to raise. And that's not a good strategy. You're going to find that marginal made hands want to play somewhat passively. A marginal made hand is something like Top pair, bad kicker, down to ace high. These hands really, really, really want to put in one or two bets at most. Okay? One or two bets at most. They do not want to play for all of the money. You have to be stop 
uh, you have to stop being afraid of giving free cards because in exchange for giving a free card, when they yell at it, go check, check, you keep your opponent in with their entire range. And it turns out something like middle pair good kicker is really good against your opponent's entire range, but it's really bad when you bet and your opponent gets to fold out all of their garbage. Let's take a look at a hand here. We have the ace 10 offsuit. We raise it up to 10 bucks at one, two, no limit. Big blind calls. King 10, four. Opponent checks. What do we do? We bet. In this scenario, we're going to be betting very, very frequently. This is a good flop for the hijack raiser. They have lots of good high cards and king X. You may say, didn't you just say check your marginal hands? Yes. Especially when a lot of money is going to be going into the pot later. We bet small. Opponent calls. Turns to nine. Opponent checks. Now, this is where a lot of people blunder. They think, all right, I have middle pair, top kicker. That's pretty good. Board's pretty draw heavy. So I should probably bet. But that would be a very big mistake here because if you do bet, what is going to happen? Well, if you get raised, obviously you have to fold and that's really, really bad. Also, if you bet and get called, what do you think you're getting called by? Well, all the kings, which you're in bad shape against. And then draws. And in this scenario, all the draws have pretty good equity. Also notice one of the draws that make a whole lot of sense for the opponent to have, the queen jack, just arrived. So this is a spot where we have a super duper duper easy check. In this scenario, this player bets 20 bucks. And this is a blunder. If you would have bet in this scenario, you are going to have a really, really, really tough time winning at poker. But you may say, my opponent will call me with jack 10. Yeah, maybe. What about all the other stuff though? Now the opponent raises. Now at this point, you have an easy fold. This player instead did not fold. They thought, I'm going to put him on a draw. Ace of spades is actually really bad to have here on the turn, by the way, because now they can't even have the ace high flush draw. Rivers of two of spades. Opponent bets 50 bucks. A lot of people think, well, now I'm getting pretty good odds. I have to call. Which you should not because you're going to be dead. Opponents have the queen jack. Shocking. Why not bet bigger on the flop? This is a flop where we're going to be betting frequently with our entire range or a lot of our range. As you bet a larger and larger portion of your range, you're essentially saying, I am betting because I have a range advantage. And when you have a small range advantage or even a big range advantage and you're betting everything, typically you don't use a big size. Now look, in this spot, I think it'd be reasonable to bet bigger because the board is very dynamic. But you have to realize that big blinds going to have a lot of trash. When you raise early position, and the big blind calls, the big blind's gonna have a lot of misses on the flop. This is very different, by the way, than if you raised on the button. If you raise on the button and the big blind calls, now you both have a lot of trash, and that forces you to bet more polarized with your best hands and your draws, and as you're betting more polarized, then you get to use a bigger size. I discussed this thoroughly at pokercoaching.com. We have a cash game masterclass, so make sure you check it out. That said, if you did want to bet bigger here, I think it's perfectly reasonable. Now you say, should you bet bigger here on the flop and then fold if you get raised? You do not want to go around betting one of the best hands you can possibly have, and then folding if you get raised. That is not a good strategy. Let's take a look at another one. Pocket eights. Eights are great. We raise it up. Opponent calls in the big blind. Flop comes. Queen, nine, seven. They check. <clears throat> Notice we raise from slightly later position this time, so we are going to be checking slightly more often, most likely. This is definitely a hand you want to be checking with because we only have two outs to improve. Um, if you had something like ace nine, maybe you could go for the bet. King nine, sure. But something like jack nine, I would probably not bet. And if I did happen to raise something like queen six suited or queen eight suited, I would very likely check that back as well. You want to make sure you're checking it back with some hands that can very easily check back the turn. Or check, check back the flop, call a turn bet, and then call a river bet. How is this different from a tournament? Well, early in a tournament, not so much. Although you'll find a lot of tournament players are not nearly as bad as one, two, no limit players. How is this different from 2-2 no limit? Not much. Should you buy in for the max? Depends on the scenario. Check, check on the flop. Turns it to a spades. Opponent checks. This is where a lot of people think. I probably have the best hand. I should bet. And to be fair, you probably do have the best hand. But what is going to call if you bet? Well, a queen, a nine, a seven, and a draw. How are you doing against all that? Well, it turns out you're actually not in great shape. How do you do against your opponent's entire range, though? That contains ace three and pocket fours and five four suited and all that trash. 
well, you're in amazing shape. So would you rather bet and get a little bit of protection against a six out draw or a three out draw? Because those will potentially fold if you bet. Or would you rather bet and then get called? Essentially, would you rather bet and get a little bit of protection but get called by a strong range? Or would you rather let it go check check and play a small pot against a super duper wide range? And the answer is, you'd rather let it go check check. That's especially true if your opponent will bluff the river very often. If your opponent will take a lot of hands like 5-4 or jack 8 or whatever and bet the river, then you definitely want to check because then you'll be able to induce bluffs. Check, check, turn. River's a 5. Opponent bets 10 bucks. Easy call. Gobble it up. This is a spot where some people actually fold. That would be a disaster. You have to realize that you've checked the flop and the turn. Your hand looks weak. Your range looks weak. Everything looks weak. And if your opponent's anywhere near competent, they're going to take a lot of king high and worse and try to bluff it. Opponent does have the jack 10. Notice if we bet the flop or the turn in this spot, we would have gotten raised. And that would have been bad. How do you know if your opponent is not watching? Is not watching what? A sporting event on TV? Their iPad? A book? You? Come on, everyone. A lot of people are saying you should always buy in for 100 big blinds. That's completely not true. I discussed this in my first cash game book, actually. Typically, you want to cover the bad players at the table, and you especially want to cover the bad players on your right. If you're sitting in a scenario though, where the bad players all have, let's say, 20 big blinds, and the good players on your left with 200 big blinds, it would be really, really dumb to buy in for 200 big blinds or even more than 20. If you have one good player on your left with a lot of chips and all the bad players have almost no chips, you typically want to be buying in for enough to cover the bad players because chips flow to the left in games with position. And because chips flow to the left, you really, really, really want to not open yourself up to getting crushed by the good players on your left. Now, quite often, the good player will have 200 big blinds, and so will all the bad players, and then it's probably fine. But you want to make sure that you are buying in logically. Back when I used to play a lot of 5, 10, and 10, 20 at Bellagio, I would usually be buying in for the maximum, but maybe one day out of seven or eight, I would not because my seat at the table was no good. Your seat at the table is no good. Don't buy in for a lot. Tip number four. Stop paying off the nets. And it is a tight, straightforward player. Think about at your poker table. How often do you hear this? I just had to see it. Or I knew I was beat there. Or you never bluff. But I call anyway. If you go play 1-2 No Limit Poker tonight, you will probably hear one of these three things at least three or four times. And you're going to find that that's a big, big, big mistake to make these calls. People call way too often at the small six because they have massive ego problems. You got to get rid of your need to know what your opponent has because, well, quite often their strategy is very clear and obvious. If your opponent's strategy is clear and obvious and they just have the nuts or a very, very good hand, simply fold. A lot of people don't like to think that they have massive ego problems, but look, if you make plays that you know to be incorrect, you're doing it for a reason. And the reason is that you need confirmation or that you want to try to prove something or whatever. You got to get all of these thoughts out of your head. It's funny. Anytime I listen to poker players talking about their big downswings or times whenever they're really struggling, a lot of the time it's because the players felt a strong need to not practice proper bankroll management. They thought they were better than they were, or at least better than their bankroll dictated. And also they usually have some sort of glaring leak in their game. Like, they have to not get bluffed. In their mind, it's a disaster to get bluffed. And in exchange for never getting bluffed, they instead call every time. If you call every time, you're going to lose. So you can't beat 1-2 because the players have wide ranges? Come on, Dean. Is that what you've been paying attention? If, that, if that's what you got out of this webinar so far, oh, go back to the beginning and try again. I was going to say just turn off your computer and quit poker, but that's probably a little too harsh. If players play wide ranges, you can win a ton of money. It's easy to beat someone who plays garbage because, well, math. Math exists. Let's take a look at a hand. Here we have the king and the queen. Low jack raises. We call. King jack seven. We check. They bet 10 bucks. Easy call. This is a spot, by the way, where our hand is already kind of marginal. We just discussed don't overplay marginal hands. This is a situation where a lot of players check raise. And to be fair, if you look at a GTO chart, it might actually say to put in a check raise here. 
but not against someone who is weak and tight and straightforward because, well, for them to bet the flop, they probably have a pretty strong range to begin with. And to raise from the low jack, they probably have a pretty strong range to begin with. And if you raise, they're not going to defend nearly as wide as the GTO strategy would recommend with all sorts of gut shots and backdoor flush draws with an overcard and all that. So for that reason, we in turn do not need to check raise quite as wide for value. Even, even still, though, this is a spot where I would just basically always check call in cash games. Turns to 10, check, opponent bets 30. You think players are getting better, better in general? They certainly are at the high stakes. At the low stakes, not so much. You, you all are literally telling me here in the chat that if you raise the seven big blinds preflop, you get 14 callers in your game. If that's the case, no, everyone's not getting better. If anything, they're getting worse which I never would have predicted because most games get more difficult in time, at least at the high levels. Um, apparently, that's not applying to poker in the smallest stakes games, so that's good. Anyway, can't fold pair into straight draw. Got a call. We have too much equity to fold. I will go ahead and tell you, though, <laughs> on the river, I'm probably already planning to fold unless I improve to three of a kind or a straight. It's an annoying spot. But you have to realize, if a tight player bets the flop and the turn and the river, they probably just have a good hand. River's a five of clubs. We check. Opponent goes all in. 1.5x pot. I mean, this is just the easiest fold. This would have been a much more difficult spot if the opponent bet 50 bucks on the river, because then you're at least getting okay odds. But even then, I think even against something like a $50 bet, it's probably fine to fold. Now, I will say some players in the small stakes games will overvalue a hand like queens or ace jack because they don't know what they're doing. If that's the case, then you certainly don't want to go around folding hands that can beat some of your opponent's value bets. But right here, most people are not value betting king nine or queens, especially for 1.5x pot all in. So fold. This is like not even a hard fold. This, this, these cards should hit the muck in half a second. This time, though, this player torched their money. They were shown the nuts. Who'd have thought? Stop paying off the nets. Tip number five. You need to improve after every session. You cannot be stagnant and expect, does that say E-X-P-E-C-T? -E expect to win at poker. Is that how you spell expect? That looks wrong. Maybe it's right though. Brain's broken. So many people simply expect to win. And because of this, they do not work hard enough. You're going to find, though, if you really want to crush one, two cash games, you need to outwork your opponents. You need to constantly review your hands and you need to consistently refine your strategy. There we go. EXP ECT. I knew it didn't look right. I'm like, that's not right. That's not right. Who wrote this thing? <sighs> Every few days, I get an email from someone who's disgruntled and mad at me. You want to know why? It's because they're no longer winning at poker. They used to be good at poker. They used to beat the game. And now they don't. And they're mad because they played in a game or a small player pool where they play against two or three really bad players and one or more of those really bad players got good at poker because they found Jonathan Little's YouTube channel and they decided to start studying a little bit and now they're not awful at poker anymore. And that has ruined the mediocre player's game. And they're mad at me for it. And honestly, I do not care. I think it is up to every poker player to get at least decent at poker, assuming you want to have any potential in winning at poker. And you got to realize that especially if you play a very small player pool against a game where there's one or two or three bad players and that's it, they might get tired of losing. And if they get tired of losing... They're going to do one of two things. They're either going to quit or they're going to get better. So recognize that. Recognize that far ahead of time. And you need to make sure that you are consistently outworking even the players who are trying to get better at poker. And I do realize that if you're like god awful at poker, if you're raising seven big blinds preflop, if you never three bet, if you pay off the nits, if you do all the stuff I'm telling you not to do here, you can get way better at poker pretty quick because you're so bad. If you are so bad at poker, if you study poker for like five hours, you will go from being like horribly terrible to just kind of bad. And if you go from losing, let's say $50 an hour to losing $5 per hour, 
that's actually a gigantic boost to your win rate. So the bad players will actually get much better way faster than the good players will get better because the good players are already pretty good. Imagine you're crushing a 5-10 game or two five. Imagine you're playing 2-5 and you're winning like 50 bucks an hour. If you get a whole lot better at poker, you may be able to beat it for like 70 bucks an hour, right? That would be a very, very big increase. And you should be very happy with that. But obviously, that's only a $20 per hour increase. If you go from losing $50 an hour to losing five, that's a $45 per hour increase in your call it win rate slash loss rate, whatever you want to think it is. And well, that's tough for the good players. It means the good players have to work hard. What is ROL sizing? What in the world does ROL mean? If one, two players limp call too much. Rawl. Is that like lol? Ha, L O L O A W L. How do you expect me to expect with an X me to respond to that? Raise to a size over the limpers that accomplishes the goals you want to accomplish. What are they limping with? Are they limping with total nonsense? If they limp with the 9 4 offsuit and they're going to call your raise to six big blinds, but fold your raise to 10 big blinds, obviously make it six. If they're going to limp with stuff like Queen Jack suited, and fold to a 10 big blind raise, but call your six big blind raise, obviously raise to 10. You got to use a little bit of common sense to win at poker. Like we discussed at the top of the show, poker is like chess, except, well, you only have to think two moves ahead. You can do it. You can do it. Was overbets one of the tips? No, but you should be using overbets. Here were the five hacks. Number one, make sure you three bet more often. Number two, fight harder in position. Number three, you have to play well with your marginal hands, which means very often being passive. Number four, stop paying off the nits. And number five, make a point to improve every session. For those who don't know, I have a training site, pokercoaching.com. We are having our biggest sale ever for Black Friday. You can check it out at pokercoaching.com slash Black Friday. And I'm about to walk you through my new advanced cash game course that I am very, very, very happy to be able to bring to you because I spilled my guts there. I told everyone everything I know. Plus, I also learned a lot from the other coaches' content. As a bonus, if you sign up at pokercoaching.com slash Black Friday right now, I just added a new multi-part series that I have been making with Slick Rick, who is a, well, small-ish stakes player. He's already won about 100,000 bucks since we started working together two months ago. So I don't know if he's a small stakes player anymore. But uh, he has been absolutely crushing it. I decided to coach him for free for one hour each week for a year. We've been doing it for about two months. So far, he has won a World Series of Poker Circuit Ring. He has made his way into medium stakes stream games. He is crushing it. And, well, I've, he, we are working together. And I uh, am being able to present you all of our coaching sessions which I think is pretty nice. Yo, 100K in two months? Yes. Believe it or not, he's been absolutely smashing it. He got a little bit lucky. He's won a bunch of tournaments. He could have lost the tournaments, but he won the tournaments instead. It's actually crazy the run he's been on. <laughs> so he's up a bunch in cash games. He's up a bunch in tournaments. I actually wanted to coach him initially with the idea that he was going to play only cash games about 60 hours per week because some people think that that's impossible. They think no one can play 60 hours a week of cash games and win money. But uh, they're incorrect. And, you know, I figured I'd prove it for fun. I'm not going to do it myself. I have a lot going on. But Slick Rick wanted to make 50 bucks an hour. And instead, he's, well, making a whole lot more than that. He's already won the circuit ring. He's also making a lot of content. So anyway, all of those sessions that I record, that I've already recorded, that I'm going to be recording for the rest of the year, is going to be part of PokerCoaching.com. Also, my team and I have been working very hard on our brand new course, which will be released just in time for Black Friday. And that is the all new advanced cash game course. You cannot buy this course. It is not for sale. But if you join Poker Coaching Premium during the Black Friday sale, you will get free access to the advanced cash game course for as long as you are a member. Who was that guy? Was that guy Rampage? No, that guy was Slick Rick. Probably don't know Slick Rick. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Up and coming poker player. Already super crusher. And I'm happy for him. It's good to see his hard work paying off. The guy has made a point to devote his self to poker. And he's doing it. What's in this cash game, advanced cash game course? 
Well, first, we have high stakes live cash game secrets from Chris Brewer. A lot of you know Chris Brewer is a absolute super crusher at live tournaments. He had one of the best years ever last year. But you may not know that he has actually been crushing the super duper nosebleed stakes online and the very high stakes live games for many years now. And I'm very, very excited to bring this content to you. He discusses how he approaches GTO poker. It is not just run the solver and do what the solver says. You have to be able to implement it. He also discusses when you should be exploiting in cash games to really, really make a ton of money, even against the best players. And then he reviews some of his biggest hands as well as the super punter Rampage Poker's biggest hand. Rampage Poker's trying to get good at poker, but he just can't help himself. He has to punt. Also, we have some content by Justin Sleba. For those who do not know, Justin Sleba came to me, I don't even know how many years ago now, eight or 10 years ago, and he was playing five cent, 10 cent online cash games. He told me my Instagram is bad and that he wants to help me with my Instagram. In exchange, he wanted one hour of coaching per month. I said, sure, my Instagram was bad. We started working together. He quickly moved up in stakes. I told him to move to Vegas, start playing live cash games. He was crushing the live cash games. I told him some people that I think he should make friends with. He started working with a lot of the best poker players in the world. And now, well, he's one of the best poker players in the world. Who'd have thought? And he helps a ton at pokercoaching.com. So he has a large section on cash games as well because he has been crushing the games forever. Well, since he started eight or 10 years ago. And he discusses defending versus aggression when you're playing very deep stacked. I realize that when you're playing deep stacked and your opponents are blasting it, it gets pretty tough. And well, you need to be able to deal with it. He also discusses why being able to make or making the nuts is also important when you're playing very, very deep stacked. He also discusses out of position, GTO concepts. Again, playing against aggression, playing out of position is hard. And Justin's going to be discussing it. We also have been working with Next Gen Poker. They are three up and coming poker players and they discuss how to navigate scenarios where you're playing the games like the Do 7 game or the stand up game. And also, Justin discusses transitioning from live to online cash games because online cash games give you an opportunity to get a lot of practice in in a short period of time. We also have a bunch of content from Brad Wilson. He's been a super crusher online for quite a while now. He's been working with poker coaching for a while as well. We have a lot of students who love his content. And he discusses all sorts of things that you must be doing to crush the online games. I have a lot of content in this course. We have a section where I go through all of the new preflop charts that we've just added to pokercoaching.com. Over 100,000 of them. Now, obviously, you don't need to go in and memorize 100,000 charts, but you do need to learn the principles that come from the charts. And you need to know how to logically adjust from those charts to take advantage of the things that your opponents are doing incorrectly. Kind of like we talked about today. Remember at the beginning of this webinar today, we discussed this chart here where the button's actually not supposed to call all that wide. I said, well, you should probably want to call a little bit wider because of the things that the opponent's doing correctly, right? So that is part of the course. And on Thanksgiving, tomorrow, if you want to go through that section of the course, it will be unlocked and available to all of you for completely free, zero dollars. Check it out at pokercoaching.com slash Thanksgiving. And yeah, click the like button. Kevin's always here telling you all to click the like button. If you enjoy this content, click the like button, leave a comment, subscribe, do that. Also, I have a section on mastering six max online games where we go through lots of the preflop scenarios that you will be in playing six handed cash games online. Those games always have a rake. And because of that, <clears throat> because of that, you have to be way more tight and aggressive than you may want to be. But fortunately for you, what you want doesn't really matter when you are playing a strategy game. What you need to do if you care about winning is make the right plays. And we discuss all of that in this section. We also discuss advanced bet sizing on the flop. And we discussed going from very rigid to dynamic bet sizes. So instead of having one bet size on the flop or two, you have multiple, as you should. We discussed when you need to be betting very large, as well as exploitative reasons for betting large. We also discuss adjusting your raise size when you are facing a bet based on, well, all sorts of things. We also discuss exploitative check-raising strategies. 
as well as when to bet small on the flop, both in GTO world and exploitatively. I have a large section on turn bet sizing as well as river bet sizing because there's a lot of money to be gained by using the ideal bet size for your specific situation or against your specific opponent. Someone in the chat earlier said that um, overbetting is a good idea. And yeah, I completely agree. So many times when I used to be sitting at five to no limit, I would make the nuts on the river with like the ace high flush. And I could literally look and tell my opponent liked their hand. And if I have the ace high flush and they like their hand, and it's clear as can be, how much should you bet? Well, <laughs> in most scenarios, the answer is all of your money. If you're super deep stacked, maybe the answer is some of your money so they can then raise. But in almost all scenarios, the answer is like 5x pot all in because they're not folding. If, you, if your opponent has a king eye flush, they're not folding. Hate to break it to you, right? So you wanna make sure you're using the bet size for your specific scenario. What is this course? This is the advanced cash game course on pokercoaching.com. Check it out at pokercoaching.com slash Black Friday right now. What happens if you play perfectly and still lose? I guess you lose. We also discuss further deep stacked adjustments for when you're playing deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. 200 big blinds deep, 400 big blinds deep, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And a big takeaway from this is that being able to make the nuts is super duper important. And you also want to reopen the action way less often if your opponent can check raise you using a big size and put you in a nasty spot with all of your bluff catchers, which will be a large chunk of your range. I also have a large section on multi-way strategies. A lot of you have been asking for this. And you know this, this short slide here does not do it justice. This is a large section on how to play using, or how, how to play in multi-way scenarios. Um, a big thing that you wanna make sure you're doing for the most part is using small bet sizes, but there still are some times where you should be using bigger bet sizes. We also, discuss how to play when you are facing aggression. And I think a lot of people in a lot of games stick around far too often. You'll also find that when you're first to act multi-way, you have to check a ton. But when you're last to act, not so much. So anyway, that's a great part of this course that I think you will learn a lot from. We also have a dual heads up, no limit review, playing 100 big blinds deep and 200 big blinds deep, featuring Justin Saliba against Jonathan Jaffe, who is one of the biggest winners in online heads up sit and goes, and he gets in there and battles in the cash games as well. They get in there, they battle against each other, they review the hands, and it's a lot of fun. We also have Justin Sleba going through not the recorded footage, but playing in real time against Jonathan Jaffe. So he is actually playing and explaining what he is doing throughout that entire process. And finally, we have Justin Saliba and Rampage Poker reviewing the hands that Rampage just played versus Doug Polk at the Lodge. That went well for Rampage. He won. Even though he's a master blaster, he picked the format that's best for him. And heads up, it's usually okay to be a master blaster. And it worked out well for him. So that's it. That is the advanced cash game course. We are able to give it to you as part of the biggest, the biggest sale we're running this year on Black Friday. Check it out at pokercoaching.com slash Black Friday. Remember, we just uploaded the new multi-part series for Poker Coaching Premium members, The Hero's Journey, where I am coaching up-and-coming poker player Slick Rick. And so far, he's been crushing it beyond my wildest dreams. <laughs> I thought I could get him to winning $50 per hour in a month or so, and, well, he's blown that out of the water. Or he's already made uh, already made 100000 in the first two months, so good for him. So, yeah, check it out. The Advanced Cash Game course is just included at pokercoaching.com. If you are a premium member, again, you can get it right now at pokercoaching.com slash Black Friday. And tomorrow, if you want to go through this first section of the new course, you can check it out at pokercoaching.com slash Thanksgiving. How do you stop punting? Well, don't ask Rampage that. How do you stop punting? The answer is realize that every decision you make at the poker table wins or loses some amount of money. Simple as that. And if you want to win money, well, you must make the decisions that win money. And if you make decisions that lose money, such as blasting it off at every opportunity, Rampage, you probably won't make it. Okay? Simple as that. Poker messes with your mind sometimes. You know, the thing is, is that a lot of people get it through their heads that 
they are supposed to care about the inevitable swings of the game. There will be variance in poker. You will have the best hand and get outdrawn sometimes, sometimes many times in a row. That is fine and normal. And if you let that bother you, you're going to lose. So why do people let the inevitable swings of the game bother them? Most of the time, they're playing on a bankroll that is way too small. They do not practice good bankroll management. And that's a big mistake because if you only have five buy-ins and you lose four of them, yeah, you're probably going to go nuts. If you keep 40 or 50 buy-ins, as you probably should if you actually care about having very, very, very good longevity in the game, and you lose four buy-ins, it's not a big deal, right? Also, a lot of people don't understand variance. They don't understand math. They don't understand that when you get it all in with aces against the jack four offsuit, you're supposed to lose some real percentage of the time. I don't even know what it is because it doesn't even matter. 17%, you're supposed to lose 18%, 16%. Who knows? It doesn't even matter. That's what I'm trying to say is that you're going to lose sometimes. You should plan for this. I think a lot of people think when they get it in with 80% equity that they are supposed to win. But you're supposed to win 80% of the time, right? I think a lot of other people, especially in small stakes games, see all of their opponents getting mad when they lose. Just because your opponents have no control over their emotions and their egos, that does not mean that you have to have no control over your emotions or your egos. If you observe a lot of the best poker players in the world, they do not care at all when they get unlucky. I would actually rather get unlucky when I play a tournament because it means that I probably didn't mess it up too bad right? What I really don't like is when I feel like I got horribly outplayed. And, you know, even then, sometimes just purely due to variance, purely because your opponent went one way or the other, you're going to feel like you got horribly outplayed. And once you realize that, then you really just shouldn't be getting upset at all about much of anything. I think a lot of people also are not accustomed to having a loss. A lot of people hate taking a loss. They don't want to lose at the end of the day. They have it in their mind that if they put in work, work in quotation marks, that they are supposed to make money. That's not necessarily true. I mean, you're going to make some equity if you're way better than your opponents, but doesn't mean you're going to win every time, right? Essentially, you have to grow up. A lot of people who complain about the bad beats, who complain about bad luck, who think that if their opponents are horrible that you can't beat them, they simply do not understand the game of poker. And it's my job to teach them, which is why we've made this course as well as the Cash Game Masterclass at PokerCoaching.com. If, by the way, if you're watching this and you're totally new to poker, we have a free course. Go to pokercoaching.com slash fundamentals. Jack for offsuit, 13.2%. Thanks, Connor. That's low. But 13.2% is a real number, 13.2%. Get used to it. Sometimes you're going to lose five in a row. It's going to happen to you one at some point if you play enough. Did you say one to 200 buy-ins for bankroll management? I have a section, I have an article on bankroll management. Go to pokercoaching.com slash bankroll. Check it out. Your bankroll is a function of the variance you expect to experience in the game and your win rate. As your win rate is lower, you need far more buy-ins. As your win rate is higher, you need way fewer buy-ins. All right, that's going to be it for today. Hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, do me a favor. Click the like and subscribe button down below. Check out pokercoaching.com slash Black Friday. We're having our biggest sale of the year. Look, if you want to learn from me and my group of coaches that I have hand-selected. These are all people who I like working with. These are all people who are very good at poker. And I love it. I'm glad that they're, I'm glad that they're here working with us. That's me for today. Good luck. Have fun. Run hot. Make the most of your opportunity. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving weekend. I'll talk to all of you next time.